You know the day destroys the night Night divides the day Try to run, try to hide Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side, yeah We chased our pleasures here Dug our treasures there Jack Holzman, what a freak. This is a guy that started a label on the back of his motorcycle. I mean, this is how he delivered his records to the stores. For me, it was a calling to start a label. It wasn't a gig, it wasn't a job, it was something that my soul simply had to do. Despite all odds, despite warnings that I would end up in a ditch someplace, I just did it. This song was written by Pete Seeger, and the credit to it reads Pete Seeger and Ecclesiastes, because the poem is from the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. It's called Turn, Turn, Turn. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time to every purpose under heaven. When Vanguard signed Joan Baez, I was pissed off because I hadn't even been in the running for that, and I don't know why. So I think I said to myself on one level, I want my Joan Baez. A time to kill, a time to heal. But I was looking for a very special kind of singer. A time to weep. I came into the early years of Electra when I started recording. To everything. To I was a performer. I was a person who was accustomed to taking a song, finding a song and crafting it so that I knew what to do with it and then performing it. And of course, my luck, my luck was that I'd run into folk music when I did, because it was just at the beginning of the folk boom. Time to build up, a time to break down, a time to dance, a time to mourn. I was told about Judy Collins by Bob Gibson, one of the great folk singers, of great interpreters of folk song, and I went to Colorado to take a look at her, and I didn't think she was ready. And about six months later, she showed up in New York, and I went to a performance, and I said, "You're ready." There is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. I was very lucky, of course, to be on Electra because Jack Holzman is a genius, and that, that label, the eclectic nature of that label, allowed me to be as eclectic as I, as I possibly could. A time you may embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. This is the Judy Collins cover, which just, as you can see, leapt right out of the bins. People really wanted to meet that girl, and, and the record was, was excellent. She was beginning to develop herself as a skilled interpreter of other people's songs. A time to gain, a time to lose, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time of love, a time of hate, a time of peace, I swear it's not too late. 
I had seen Tom Paxton around the village, but I think at that point I was more smitten by the political song and the protest song because that was mirroring what was happening in, in New York and in the country. We rambled around in the rain and snow And here's to you, my rambling. His songs seemed simple to me. But when I sat down with him and he went through a wide range of material, I realized that he was a melodist of, of great discernment. In Tulsa town, we chanced to stray. We thought we'd try to work one day. The boss said he had room for one, says my old pal. We'd rather bum. Oh, well, the rambling thing, of course, you know, it's, it's so romantic, isn't it? You know, Kerouac on the road, and and uh, it's only when you've done a little bit of rambling that you realize how bloody awfully hard it is, and, and uncomfortable, and, and hungry, and uh, tired. May all your rambling bring you joy. But it's a great great American myth, you know, the rambler, the ramblin' man, ramblin' Jack. <laughs> the weather, it was cold and damp. He got the chills and he got them bad. They took the only friend I had. I realized that Tom Paxton was a person who wrote beautiful melodies, significant words. The interesting thing about him was that he did it every day. He was a true songwriter. He'd spend six to eight hours a day writing songs, practicing them, working them through, and he had a wide range. He did protest songs, Lyndon Johnson, Tell the Nation, but he also would do children's songs. And he had a, there was a gentle voice, and he wrote simple songs. It was very, very important to write a simple, good song, and he did that. He left me here to ramble on. My rambling pal is dead and gone. If when we die, we go somewhere, I'll bet you a dollar he's rambling there. Tom Paxton, a, a lovely songwriter, great children's songs, beautiful melodies. May all your rambling bring you joy. Here's to you, my rambling boy. May all The West Coast is an interesting conundrum because music that was made on the West Coast and record, company, record labels that were based out there with the exception of Capital, their records rarely moved eastward. Records made in the East moved to the West very comfortably. But I had been there in 1964 looking for artists and really couldn't find much of them. You do just what you choose to do. 
there was an L.A. scene and then there was a San Francisco scene, and they came from different points of view. Uh, San Francisco was much more dope-infused uh, and a little bit more raw. The scene out of Los Angeles was, was more careful in a way, but the artists that were in Los Angeles were wonderful. Yeah, I've heard a funny thing. New York was being picked over. Every, all the record companies were based in New York and they were all going to the same shows and suddenly you know, there were eight other A&R men and it was tough to make a move. In California, the, the East Coast people were not paying a lot of attention and uh, that's how I found love. I walked into a club one night and there they were. Arthur Lee and love. One of the few certifiable geniuses I've, I've run into m music making. He could play each instrument better than any member of the band and frequently did. What is happening and how have you been? Gonna go but I'll see you again. And oh, the music is so loud. And then I fade into love. Standing everywhere Across the street I'm at the stop of fair And here They always play my songs And me I wonder if it's Wrong or right They come here just the same About their games, they think it obsolete. If you go back across the street, yeah, street, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. they were playing at a club called Beat Olitos. I knew nothing about. Uh, love, but I saw their name in a list of club appearances. I said, well, interesting name for a group, I better go see that. And I, a friend of mine who knew about the band went with me, and I walk into this place, which I previously described as the black hole of Calcutta with a door charge. And there was Arthur Lee on the stage, the tongues of his shoes hanging out. Uh, he had these sort of granny glasses hanging down on his nose, and they had prismatic lenses, one red, one green, like he used to see for watching stereo movies. Uh, and, but he was seeing things like a bug would see things, 16 different views out of each eye. Uh, and he was just wailing away. I'll be back to save a seat for me If you just can't make the room Look up and see me on the thing that he had was a connection with an audience, and the audience was as entertaining as the band was. Gorgeous girls with iron blonde hair. It, it, it was a scene out of uh, a benevolent ring of Dante's Inferno, but it was it was it was alive, and I just was smitten with it. And I spoke to the band, and we signed him within 48 hours. Love Forever Changes voted most every poll as the number one or two album to come out of uh, the Los Angeles rock scene of, of the 60s and early 70s. I came to The Doors through a neural connection with Love. Love was the top band on the bill, and Arthur Lee said to me, you ought to stick around for the band at the bottom of the bill. And I did, and it was The Doors. And I wasn't impressed, but I was compelled by something. I went back four nights. The fourth night, sometimes 
if I hear a specific song that I have some familiarity with and I get that, that's the portal through which I come and totally understand their music. They happen to play uh, the Alabama song from Mahogany, uh, Brecht File, and I said, wow, <laughs> and now I get it. Well, show me the way to the next whiskey bar. This was a, a band well-versed in verse. They were well-read. They had seen a lot of movies. They listened to a lot of music. Uh, John Densmore and Ray Manzarek were essentially jazz musicians. It gave Jim a lot of freedom. And each of the benefits that were brought to the group by the individual musicians was used by the entire group. The group also made decisions as a unit. If, if one person didn't like me, that thing never, we never would have had uh, the doors. They would contend to be just as big as love. They ended up being much bigger. Tim Buckley is 21. He writes some of his songs with Larry Beckett, who he describes as a poet who is now starving in Venice, California. But it's unlikely that Tim Buckley is starving because having made a considerable name for himself in America, he's now on the way to become, becoming a cult over here. Tim Buckley's roots are in blues, country and folk music. And his songs have a plaintive poetic quality which reflect these roots. Here's Tim Buckley with Lee Underwood on guitar, Danny Thompson on bass, and Carter Collins on conga drums. A song which is composed by Tim Buckley is called I'm Coming Home Again. Tim Buckley was another artist that wrote songs from the inside out, and he was a very careful songwriter. He was making records for him, and for eternity perhaps, and he had this absolutely angelic voice, not of this world, and he didn't stay in this world very long. But he had something very special to offer. And he sort of made more jazz-oriented records with uh, people that he could woodshed with. And Happy Sad came out of that experience on the Lorca album, which is really a classic album, came out of that as well. Tim Buckley, not of this world, and he parted it far, far too quickly.
I got signed to Electra when I was to its publishing company when I was still in high school. When I was about 17, I got a publishing deal. And people were recording my songs and you know, friends of mine, people that I knew, people that were on their, their label, and, and a few others, like Tom Rush. Um, I think he was on Electra too. Tom Rush, great bottleneck guitar player, still performing widely, has a very, very large audience. Uh, and a, and a wonderful human being. I've been out walking I don't do that much talking these days These days These days I seem to think a lot about the things that I forgot to do When Gimel and Daleth were standing between And out of the evening was growing a veil That pined for the pine woods and ached for the sail There's something forgotten I want you to know The freckles of rain they are telling me so Oh, it's the half remark Question. Most all American independent labels had troubles getting represented in Europe. The major labels were just not interested in us. And so in uh, the mid-60s, we decided to set up shop here in the UK. Uh, and we asked Joe Boyd to run the UK operation. One of Joe Boyd's first signings was the Incredible String Band, whom I adored. They were, they were the epitome of, of, of British folk. An elephant madness has covered the sun And the judge and the jury still play for the fun They've torn all the roses, washed all the soap And the martyr who marries them dares not elope I had to struggle and persuade Jack Holtzman, who owned Electra, to let me sign them to Electra. And that was really the real moment where I said, you know, a, I love this, and B, this music can find a bigger market than the upstairs room of pubs. It had various different incarnations. I mean, the first uh, part of the Incredible String Band, 1965, we made one record for Joe Boyd and Electra, which was essentially just uh, uh, what we'd been doing in the clubs before that, plus a few new songs. And uh, after that record, everyone thought that was pretty much it. We made a record, that was it. So I went to Morocco, Clive went to Afghanistan, and Mike stayed in Britain. I came back with flutes and various instruments, drums and so on, and uh, Cl uh, Clive still being in Afghanistan, Mike and I then got together and began playing as a duo. And that's when that first record, um, uh, 5,000 Spirits, actually got into the charts and so on at that point because it happened to coincide with what was going on in, uh, in, uh, in, in what was Flower Park. The flower and its petal, the root and its grass, the earth and its bigness, the breath and its gasp, the mind and its motion, the foot and its move, the life and its pattern, the heart and its love. Oh, it's the old forgotten question. What is it that we are part of? Oh, 
what is it that we are? But then came the next record, The 5,000 Spirits of the Layers of the Onion, with this incredible cover by The Fool, the psychedelic cover, and the band was something totally different. So I listened to the album over and over and over again through headphones with the speakers blaring in the room as well until I was so immersed in the music the various steps I would need to take were clear to me. The MC5 and the Stooges came to Electra through the good offices of an artist relations person on our staff named Danny Fields. He had seen the MC5 and the Stooges and he was absolutely knocked out. And he called me on a Saturday and he said, you've got to sign him, I'm not getting off the phone until you sign him, sounding like me. I called Jack Holtzman at Electra, who was the president and owner of Electra, and uh, I said, Hi, I'm in uh, Ann Arbor, and I've just seen two of the greatest bands. Now, one of these bands is really big locally. They draw in 3,000 people. They have local radio on their side, blah, blah, blah. And they're all wrapped up and ready to go. Um, the other band is a little more outre. Since we broke away for our message, Iggy has been in the crowd and out again three different times. They seem to be enjoying it, and so does he. We were discovered by man, uh, Danny Fields, the uh, publicist for Elektra Records, who was out scouting the MC5 and uh, happened to walk into our show. We were signed shortly thereafter and, uh, and the sort of the, as an afterthought to the signing of the five. And that's a big deal in a small town area. So after we got signed, we began to get, then we had an agent, we could get a hundred bucks for a gig. We could get 200 bucks, we could get 300 bucks, we could get 500 bucks and up to where we could, we could draw 1,000, 1,500 people ourselves. Or if we tried to cross the state line, we could draw 15 people who regretted having paid. <laughs> <laughs> We're just like, you know, if we went to Ohio or something, it's like, what is this? This is nice. You know? <laughs> These days, such a, a procedure would take from the time someone saw someone they loved until they got signed to a record company. It would take a year. That very Monday morning, on the phone, uh, the president of the record company said to me, make a deal, sign them. So I said, you are both signed to Electra Records. And that was a big deal then. Everybody knew Electra who collected music. That's peanut butter. And I couldn't make head or tail of the Stooges, but Danny insisted I should make a deal with them, very much like the deal I made with the MC5. And he so believed in them that I had to back his belief. The Stooges, one of the richest act in terms of memories I have, and one I didn't want to sign and had to be convinced.
Nico. She only uh, made the marble index for us. She was gorgeous, but uh, you'd have an appointment with her for something on Wednesday, and Wednesday would come and no Nico, and a month later she'd call you up and I'd say, where were you on so-and-so? Oh, I had to go to Europe. <laughs> and that would be it. She and her harmonium was a world that was fascinating. And she had been influenced by writers like Leonard Cohen and Jackson Brown. She was someone you would hope to meet in a forest. The thing that attracted me to bread was a, in part the doing of Tom Paxton. Tom Paxton knew how to write simple songs. Bread wrote songs that were even simpler with absolutely exquisite melodies. How tough it is to write a simple song with one syllable words. Almost impossible. The first record came out at the same time as uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash, and it kind of got lost. But the second record, I put them back into the studio immediately after the first album, and uh, I walked in there one day and, and I heard several songs, and Baby I'm a Want You is what I chose, and it became their first hit single, and the band just was incredibly successful as a result, and they were great fun to work with. They also used the studio at times of the day when no other act would ever use it. They came in at 9 o'clock, took a break at lunch uh, for about an hour, left at 5, went home to their families. Everybody else was coming in at 7 o'clock, so we got a lot of use out of the studio. Bread, the art of writing a simple song. We did the obvious, we put them on dollar bills, and uh, it, was, it was wonderful working with them. They were great songwriters and uh, exquisite uh, interpreters of their own material. Someone asked David Gates one day when he would know he's arrived, and he said, when I hear my music in the elevator. This is too, too good. Because yeah, okay, so eventually Electra Records is in this really enormous building that is on um, Columbus Circle in Manhattan. And it occupies the whole whatever floor, 27th floor, say, you know. Or maybe it's the 87th floor. I really don't know. But every morning Jack Holtzman gets in the elevator. And between the time he gets in the elevator and he gets off on his floor, he has taken out 
a screwdriver set and has disconnected the Muzak in the elevator. <laughs> He's disconnected the speakers, clipped them, and put them back in again and gone about his business. It's like a one-man crusade to eliminate elevator Muzak from, from the world. interesting about Carly is of all the artists I've ever had, she was the one who was born with a golden spoon in her mouth. She was from the very famous Simon & Schuster uh, publishing family. And she, their, their parents had a salon and they had the greats uh, in on the weekends and, and for salon evenings and afternoons. She was very tall, she was gorgeous, she had a wonderful voice. And it was as if a writer from The New Yorker was writing songs. so pensive but perfect in pearls. Mama just killed a man Put a gun against his head Pulled my trigger, now he's dead Mama, life is just They were a wonderful band, and we knew how to break seven-minute singles. The material was meticulously produced. It did not drain its energy out of the material, as so happens when records are overproduced. I loved the band, and so I did it. Goodbye, everybody. great about it. I could record anybody and anything I wanted. And I had a seat at the grown-ups table, namely the major labels table, because we had shown that we were, we were what indies do best. We're there in service to the music. And if you can make a living, that's nice too. But I always believed that if you took care of the music, the music would take care of me. 
It's a slow motion night in the hot city lights. Past time when the good folks are snoring in bed on a loose jointed cruise to recolor your blues and with illegal notions alive. Alive in your head. Electra never lost an artist to a major label in a negotiation. In the case of Harry Chapin, who was also going to Columbia and told me he was going to Columbia, I smarted for a week because I did not have that artist. And I finally came in early one Sunday morning and said, I'm, I'm at the airport and I'm coming to your house and I'm not leaving your house until I've convinced you to sign with Electra. And that's exactly what I did. And she's all that you're hoping as her coat falls open. Give her bread and she leads you to a bed on the floor. Where for ten million years and through ten billion tears, the armies of good men have marched back from their wall. By that time, we had merged, uh, we had formed a consortium, in effect, of Warner, Electra, and Atlantic. And we were part of Warner Communications, and I said, and I grandly said, and I'll fly you out on the company jet, which wives and dogs and equipment, uh, the, the jet was stuffed. And we spent a month in California at the Electra Studios recording, and it was a wonderful experience. And the medic has bought shots for what you have caught, and your leave is all over, you're back on the line. And you joke in the trenches of the hot-blooded wenches And the things that you'll do when they next give you the time and I always would have arguments with Harry about the difference between craft and art. I thought he wrote out of craft and that he could push himself more. And and like most songwriters, when everybody else was off having lunch, Harry was sitting in the studio trying to write another song. It was only after he died that he realized his life had been art. Really a great man. Miss him. I love my artist. I mean, they took a chance on me, which is, a, you know, which is a. Well, when we when we're successful, it's not difficult for them to do. You have a tissue. There are a few artists I feel that way about. Jack Holzman, I think that he he's such a clever guy because he's also very uh, technologically savvy. And he was trying to make that serve art, you know. And he, besides, I mean, he was not just a, a blithering idealist like, like the kids he let go do this thing. He actually did, you know, run a company that made a lot of money. And in the end, he sold it for many millions of dollars. So Asylum became reunited with Electra. I mean, that was a whole different label. That was David Geffen starting a label. And then it was, and, and at a certain point when he sold his label to the same 
conglomerate, Warners, they combined, they had Electra sitting around, and they combined Electra Asylum and made Geffen the president of that for a few years, and and then he moved on. Right on dancing. There's nothing you can do about it anyway. Just do the steps that you've been shown by everyone you've ever known. Until the dance becomes your very own, no matter how close to yours, another steps have grown. Record companies are about relationships, the relationships you have with the artist. The reason I left was managers coming to me and say, from now on, you deal with me. We're going to give you the record. We're going to give you the cover. Your job is to finance it and to distribute it and to market it. Not for me. That's not why I, th why I wanted to do this. I wanted to work with the artist. And if they thought that we as surrogates for the audience had nothing to offer the artist, then they should go elsewhere. That's ultimately the reason I left the, the business was the galoots, as like, uh, the galoots are kind of like hoodlums, were coming to the party, and I just didn't want to deal with that. Keep a fire for the human race. Let your prayers go drifting into space. You never know what will Just as easily it could all disappear Along with whatever meaning you might have found Don't let the uncertainty turn you around Go on and make a joyful sound Into the dancer you have grown From a sea So many artists, so many memories, so many years.